thank you all on behalf of Julia for coming today and for showing solidarity with him. That's a, a critical first stage in getting Julian freedom. Whenever I visit Julian, we meet in a room he knows too well. There is a bare table and pictures of Ecuador on the walls. There's a bookcase where the books never change. The curtains are always drawn and there's no natural light. The air is still and fetid. This is room 101. Before I enter room 101, I must surrender my passport and phone. My pockets and possessions are examined. The food I bring is inspected. The man who guards room 101 sits in what looks like an old-fashioned telephone box. He watches a screen, watching Julian. There are others unseen, agents of the state, watching and listening. Cameras are everywhere in room 101. To avoid them, Julian maneuvers us both into a corner, side by side, flat up against the wall. This is how we catch up, whispering and writing to each other on a notepad, which he shields from the cameras. Sometimes we laugh. I have my designated time slot. When that expires, the door in room 101 bursts open and the guard says, time is up. On New Year's Eve, I was allowed an extra 30 minutes and the man in the phone box wished me a happy new year, but not Julian. Of course, room 101 is the room in George Orwell's prophetic novel, 1984, where the thought police watched and tormented their prisoners, and worse, until people surrendered their humanity and principles and obeyed Big Brother. Julian Assange will never obey Big Brother. Yes. That's the difference. His resilience and courage, which I have seen over the past nine, eight, nine, ten years, including his long detention are nothing less than astonishing. Julian is a distinguished Australian, a political refugee who, as my colleagues, previous speakers, have emphasised, has committed no crime, yet he is subject to what the United Nations has called arbitrary detention. Under international law, he has the right of free passage to freedom but this is denied. He has the right to medical treatment without fear of arrest, but this is denied. He has the right to compensation, but this is denied. His crime has been to make sense of dark times by publishing the truth about the duplicity of governments that claim to be democratic. WikiLeaks, of which, as you know, Julian is the founder and editor-in-chief, is real journalism, of which any true democracy should be proud. It has a unique and impeccable record of authenticity and truth-telling, which no newspaper, no TV channel, no radio station, no BBC, no ABC, no New York Times, no Washington Post, no Guardian can equal. Yeah. Indeed, <laughs> in 
need to change them all, and that is why he is being punished. Let me remind you of these achievements. Last week, the International Court of Justice ruled that the British government had no legal powers over the Chagos Islanders, yeah. who in the 1960s and 70s were expelled in secret from their homeland on the island of Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean and sent into exile and poverty. Countless children died, many of them from what the doctors call sadness. It was a crime few knew about. For almost 50 years, the British have denied the islanders the right to return to their homeland, which they had given to the Americans for a major military base. In 2009, the British Foreign Office concocted a marine reserve around the Chagos Archipelago. This touching concern for the environment was exposed as a fraud when WikiLeaks published a secret cable from the British government reassuring the Americans that, and I quote, the former inhabitants would find it difficult, if not impossible, to pursue their claim for resettlement on the islands if the entire Chagos Archipelago were a marine reserve, unquote. The truth of the conspiracy has been accepted as evidence by Britain's High Court and it clearly influenced the momentous decision of the International Court of Justice. <laughs> WikiLeaks has revealed how the United States spies on its allies, how the CIA can watch you through your iPhone, how presidential candidate Hillary Clinton took vast sums of money from Wall Street for secret speeches that reassured the bankers that if she was elected, she would be their friend. In 2016, WikiLeaks revealed a direct connection between Clinton and organized jihadism in the Middle East. Terrorists, in other words, one email sent in 2014 disclosed that when Clinton was U.S. Secretary of State, she knew that Saudi Arabia and Qatar were funding Islamic State, yet she accepted huge donations for her Clinton Foundation from both governments. She then approved the world's biggest ever arms sale to her Saudi benefactors, arms that are currently being used against the stricken people of Yemen. WikiLeaks has also published more than 800,000 files from Russia, including from inside the Kremlin, telling us more about the machinations of power in Russia than all the specious hysterics in Washington known as Russiagate. This is real journalism, journalism of a kind now considered exotic, <laughs> the antithesis of Vichy journalism, which speaks for the enemy of the people. The Vichy government, as you've just been reminded, occupied France on behalf of the Nazis. Vichy journalism is censorship by omission, such as the untold scandal of the way governments in Canberra have colluded with the United States to deny Julian his rights as an Australian citizen and to silence him. Prime Minister Julia Gillard went as far as ordering the Australian Federal Police to investigate and prosecute Assange and WikiLeaks until she was informed by the AFP that alas, no crime had been committed. Last weekend, the Sydney Morning Herald published a lavish supplement promoting a celebration of women at the Sydney Opera House next Sunday. Among the leading participants is the former Australian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Julie Bishop. You may have noticed that Bishop has been on show in the media lately, lauded as a loss to politics 
an icon, someone called her to be admired. The elevation to celebrity feminism of one so politically primitive as Bishop tells us how much so-called identity politics have subverted an essential truth. That what matters above all, that what matters above all is not your gender, but the class you serve. Before she entered politics, Julie Bishop was a lawyer who served the notorious asbestos miner, James Hardy, who fought claims by men and their families dying horribly with black lung disease. Lawyer Peter Gordon recalls Bishop, and I quote, rhetorically asking the court why workers should be entitled to jump court queues just because they were dying, unquote. Bishop says she, quote, acted on instructions, professionally and ethically. Perhaps she was merely acting on instructions when she flew to London and Washington in July last year with her ministerial chief of staff, who had signaled that the Australian foreign minister would raise Julian's case and begin the diplomatic process of bringing him home. Julian's father had written a moving letter to the then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull asking the government to intervene diplomatically to free his son. He told Turnbull that he was worried Julian might not leave the Ecuadorian embassy alive. Julie Bishop had every opportunity in the UK and the US to present a diplomatic solution that would bring Julian home. But this required the courage of one proud to represent a sovereign, independent state, not a vassal. Instead, she made no attempt to contradict the British Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, when he said outrageously that Julian faced serious charges. What charges? There were no charges. Australia's Foreign Minister abandoned her duty to speak up for an Australian citizen. Prosecuted with nothing, charged with nothing, guilty of nothing. Will those feminists who fawn over this false icon at the Opera House next Sunday be reminded of her role in colluding with foreign forces to punish an Australian journalist? One whose disclosures have shown that rapacious militarism has smashed the lives of ordinary women all over the world. In Iraq alone, 700,000 widows. So what can be done? I urge you to build a campaign to demand that the Australian government fulfills its obligations to its citizens and users its diplomatic authority to bring Julian home. A government that was prepared to act in response to a public campaign to rescue the refugee football player, Hakim al Arabi from torture and persecution in Bahrain, is capable of bringing Julian Assange home. The refusal the refusal by the Department of Foreign Affairs to acknowledge, let alone enable, the United Nations declaration that Julian is the victim of arbitrary detention and has a right to his freedom is a scandalous breach of the spirit of international law. DFAP's cynical silence is no less than shameful and not the behavior of a democracy. So the question for us is this, why has the Australian government made no serious attempt to free Assange? Why did Julie Bishop bow to the wishes of two foreign powers? Is it because so much of this democracy has been traduced by its servile relationships and integrated with lawless, foreign power. Make no mistake, 
the persecution of Julian Assange means the conquest of us all, of our independence, our self-respect, our intellect, our politics, our compassion, our culture. So put away your phones, stop scrolling, organize, take direct action, occupy, make a noise, be brave, defy the thought police. If Julian can stand up for them, so can you and so can all of us. Thank you.